Take God's Word this morning, please, and open to the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 this morning. And would you stand for the reading of God's Word? We're going to read one verse, just verse 18, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 18. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Thank you so much. You may be seated. I know you just got up, but you did. <laughs> Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we are just so profoundly grateful, Lord, for all of your blessings. Lord, help us as we look at this verse to see it in a new light, and may we indeed be filled with uh, gratitude and thanksgiving for all that you have done. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Roger Kipling uh, was a wonderful British poet, and Mr. Kipling uh, was a man who earned a lot of money because of his writings. And one time a newspaper reporter came up to him and said, Mr. Kipling, I just read that someone calculated that the money that you make from your writings amounts to over $100 a word. And Mr. Kipling raised his eyebrows and said, I I did not know that. And then the uh, cynical reporter reached into his pocket He pulled out a $100 bill. He gave it to Mr. Kipling, and he said, here's a $100. Give me one of your $100 words. And Mr. Kipling looked at the $100 bill. He folded it up. He put it in his pocket, and he said, thanks. (laughs) Well, thanks certainly is a $100 word. In fact, I think it's worth more than that. I think it's a $1 million word. It's a word that we don't hear often enough. It's a word that... uh, that too often it's forgotten. I think that if any people have reason to give thanks to God, it's we who live here in America. And if anyone in America, any people in America, have reason to be thankful to the goodness of God, it's Christians. It's those who know the Lord Jesus. And if any group of Christians have an obligation to be thankful to God, it's we here at at Grace because we are so blessed from Almighty God. So I want us to look at this verse here today. And I want us to look at just three principles I want to draw from it and with regard to gratitude and learning to be thankful to the Lord. This is something, I know that we all know this, but this is something that we all need to be reminded about continually um, as we come upon the holiday of Thanksgiving. I think a spiritual holiday. I've read this week where there are some groups uh, that want to cancel Thanksgiving or try to rename it in some other way. I hope that doesn't happen. I think this is a wonderful holiday where we recognize our blessings from Almighty God. So here's the first thing I want you to see. Number one, gratitude is always to be expressed. Look again in verse 18. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God. Now, the two words, give thanks, is actually one word in the Greek, and it's the word eucharisteo, eucharisteo. And you could almost hear the word eucharist in that Greek word. That's where we get the word from. And it just simply means to give thanks, to return thanks for something that someone has done. This particular word was always used in reference to deity. The Greeks would use this when they would pray to their gods, and they would always pray to their gods with thanksgiving. And what the Apostle Paul does is he does this many times in many places in the Bible. He'll take that word and he will baptize that word and he pulls it into the Christian faith. And now as Christians, we are to be Eucharistia. We're to be thankful to God. We're to give thanks to God all the time. In fact, in the early church, when they would take the Lord's Supper Uh, The word that they would use to uh, talk about the Lord's Supper is the word Eucharistio. And this is where we get the word Eucharist from. You ever wonder why some people call the Lord's Supper the Eucharist? Well, that goes all the way back into the early church because when they came to the Lord's Supper, they knew that what it was all about was giving thanks to the Father for Jesus Christ. That's what we just did. When we took the Lord's Supper, we were in our own way uh, practicing that one command to give thanks to God the Father. Now, this word here also is a present tense word, which simply means it's a continual action. We don't give thanks to God once. We live a life of continual thanksgiving to Almighty God. 
We're thankful to him all the time. And, and that should be something that's characteristic of the life of the believer. We're constantly thankful. We're giving thanks. Paul loved this word. He used it a lot. In fact, look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and look at verse number 2. Notice he says there, we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. Same word there. We give thanks always. Look in chapter 2, look at verse 13. For this cause we also thank we God without ceasing, because when you receive the word of God, you, receive, you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but it as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Paul says, I give thanks to God because I know that you receive the word of God. He's talking to the church at Thessalonica there. When Paul came, they received the word of God well. They knew it was not of man, but it was indeed the word of God. And Paul says, I'm thankful for that. And let me just say, by the way, I'm thankful for that here from you here at Grace. You all love God's word. You receive God's word. It's a joy to be able to speak the word of God to people that believe it is indeed the word of God, and you receive it well. So Paul was thankful to, the, to God for that. Look in 2 Thessalonians, look in chapter 2, look down in verse number 1. Again, he says, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all towards other abound. And Paul, again, was thanking God for these believers because he saw them growing in faith. He saw them exercising love to one another. So he's just thankful. Look, one more passage. Look in chapter 2 of 2 Thessalonians. Look, drop down to verse 13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Paul's thanking God for their salvation that God had wrought in their heart. And so Paul, you see this all throughout his letters. He's constantly, Eucharistio, he's constantly giving thanks to God. And, and brethren, that is to be our default mode as believers. We are thankful continually when we see God working. Gratitude is not an option. It is an obligation. This is another thing I notice about this word here. This is it's one word in the Greek. It is a present tense. We do it continually, but also it's a command. God is commanding us, give thanks. You know, it's just like we are to give to the Lord. You know, part of our worship service is in giving. Uh, also part of our worship is just in thankfulness. You know, every time we give, actually, what we're doing is we're thanking God. We're thanking him whenever we give. And so we have to recognize that ingratitude is a sin because if we're not grateful, then we're not obeying God's command, and it's a sin against God. Shakespeare described ingratitude as a marble-hearted fiend. That is to say, someone who had an, an, an ungrateful heart, they had a heart that was as hard as solid marble, what he was saying. The Bible says in Romans 1.21, Paul's describing the lost world. He's describing the sins of the lost world. And one of the greatest sins that a person can commit is he describes, he says, that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were they thankful. We live in a world today that doesn't really recognize God or glorify God for who he is or express true thankfulness for what God has done. That's why Paul says, look, in everything, we're to give thanks so I want to ask you, do you express thankfulness continually? Do you express thankfulness to your wife for being the wife that she is and the mother that she is and t taking care of you and the family and all that she does for your children? Have you expressed thanks to your husband for working hard and bringing home the, uh, the check that takes care of you and your family and all of that? Do you, have you thanked the person who led you to Jesus Christ? Are you thankful to the Sunday school teacher that taught you the word of God and taught you more of Christ? Are you thankful to other believers that encourage you in the faith and the fellowship? We should constantly be expressing that gratitude to God for others. But here's the second lesson we see here. Gratitude is to be expressed, but gratitude is always to be expansive. What do I mean by that? Look again at the verse, and everything give thanks. Notice in everything, give thanks. The idea of everything means in all circumstances, despite what might happen, 
Someone translates it like this, at all times and in all circumstances, we are told to give thanks. That is in everything. Now, this is, may pose a difficulty for some of us when we read this. You know, how can we be thankful in everything? We're, you know, if God would have said in most things be thankful, we could understand that. Or it said in the good things be thankful, we can certainly understand in that. But Paul here says we are to thank God in everything. Now, let me just give you a little qualification here. Nowhere in the Bible does it say we are t- to feel grateful. It's not saying you are to feel gratitude because, you know, those things about feelings is they're very unstable. You understand that? Our feelings sometimes are affected by the weather, by the temperature, by how you're feeling, by the amount of sleep that you got. Thankfulness has nothing to do with feelings. We're not commanded to feel grateful. It doesn't matter, matter how we feel, whether good or bad, we are to be thankful. It's a command. Now, you might say, well, that's easy for the Apostle Paul to write down and say. Well, actually, it's not easy for Paul to say. I don't know if you know much about the Apostle Paul, but he was not some ivory tower theologian that lived, you know, alone, sequestered somewhere, uh, divorced from the realities of life. That was not Paul. If you read about Paul, you're going to find out that he went through a lot of suffering. He went through a lot of difficulties. He was a weather-beaten warrior for Christ. I mean, we can go through the Bible and catalog all the suffering that Paul went through on behalf of Christ and the gospel. He suffered hunger. He suffered thirst, loneliness, shipwreck, imprisonment, robbery, stonings, uh, assassination attempts, trials, and all those things. And yet the apostle, and by the way, when Paul wrote this, he had been been, uh, chased out of the city of Thessalonica. He had been there for a while preaching the gospel, but in the end he was chased out. But he writes a letter back to these believers and says, and everything give thanks, and everything give thanks. In Acts chapter 16, we're told the story of the apostle Paul and Silas who went to the city of Philippi, preached the gospel, and they were beaten with rods and then thrown into a prison. And what did Paul and Silas do there in that prison? Did they whine? No, they worshiped. They were not sighing. They were singing. They began to sing. And you know the story there in Acts chapter 16 that, that the jailhouse began to shake. There was an a, a earthquake. One preacher said that was the first jailhouse rock right there at, at Philippi in that, in that prison cell. They were singing praises to God. I'm not sure what they sang, but it was probably something like, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Yeah, we can be thankful to God in everything. And part of that is, let me just give you a few things here. We are to be grateful for the blessings of life, for the blessings of life. Proverbs 10.22 says this, the blessing of the Lord makes one rich and he adds no sorrow to it. You know, you're rich because you're blessed by God. If you're a Christian, you've been blessed by God and you're rich. It doesn't matter what your bank account says. I like what one definition of a Christian uh, is one person wrote, a Christian is someone that does not have to consult his bank book to see how wealth, wealthy he really is. I like that. If you want to know how rich you really are, add up everything that money cannot buy and death cannot take away that you have, that money cannot buy and death cannot take away, that's how rich you really are. I want to tell you something, friend. You're rich if you know Jesus. You're rich. I'm not sure what I'm, I'm honest when I say this. I don't know what I have in the bank. My wife takes care of all that. All I know is I get an allowance if I'm good. Sometimes I don't get it. I'm not sure how much money I have, but I want to tell you something, friend. I feel rich. I feel incredibly rich because of Jesus, because of all the blessings that God gives. Just simp- Do you rejoice in just the simple blessings of God every day that he bestows upon us? For example, just food, just for your daily bread. Sometimes we just... Take it for granted that, that all the things that we have. I was just in a country where a lot of people are going hungry. A lot of people are so very poor and begging for bread. Did you know that two-thirds of the world goes to bed hungry every night? Two-thirds of the world. One-third of the world is underfed. Another part of the world is starving. And here in America, we complain about dirty dishes. Dirty dishes reveal the blessing of God. Don't you understand that? You have dishes that are dirty because God has been good to you. 
So we should be thankful for every blessing that God gives, just the simple blessings. Don't ever sit down at a meal without bowing your head. Don't be ashamed in public to do it. Let people know you're a believer, that you thank God for his blessings. We ought to be like that little girl whose father was a disc jockey, and she had heard her dad on the radio many times doing advertisements. She was asked to go to a friend's house for dinner, and the mother asked this little girl, said, would you pray for the meal tonight? And she said, well, sure. And she cleared her throat, and she looked at her watch, and she said, this food, friends, is coming to you through courtesy of Almighty God. (laughs) And she's exactly right. Did you ever just stop and thank God for just clean water? Just clean water. Again, I came from a place where a lot of folks don't have clean water. Just that one simple thing there. I remember once when I was in uh, Ghana, Africa, and I had been going through uh, this region, going from village to village, just preaching the gospel. And we were leaving one village and going to another, and there was a lady there, and she was speaking to me, but I couldn't understand what she was saying. She was very passionate. And the translator said, I asked him, I said, what is she saying to me? And the translator said, she's saying, we need water. We need water. Because in that village, there was no clean water. They had to go miles to get water that they could use. And those words haunted me. I I was trying to figure out a way, how can we help these people just have clean water? Just clean water would change their life. And yet here, we have these things so easily. Let's not take these blessings for granted. So we ought to be grateful for the blessings of life, but also we ought to be grateful for the burdens of life. Again, the verse says, in everything we are to give thanks. Notice it doesn't say for everything, give thanks. I can't be thankful for everything. If, the, if I was to be thankful for everything, that means I would have to be thankful for some of the bad things that sinful people do. I'm not thankful for that. I'm not thankful for the things that the devil does to people. That's not what it's saying here. It doesn't say for everything give thanks. It says in everything give thanks. You see, I'm not thankful for the storm, but I can be thankful in the storm. When bad things come, I'm not thankful for that bad thing, but I'm thankful in it because I know that even in those troublesome times, even in those those painful experiences of life, God is working, and I can be thankful in it not necessarily thankful for it. Why can I be thankful in it? Because I believe that God is sovereign, and the Bible says God works all things together for good to those that love God, to those that are called according to his purpose. I don't understand what good could come out of this, but God does, and it's enough for me that I can trust God that he can bring good out of this, these difficulties. I know that many of you, I'm I'm preaching to many of you where you've had a hard year, Some of you here, you've lost loved ones. Some of you here, you have wept. You have had a broken heart this year. And I realize that. But friend, I want you to know that although you you don't have to be thankful for that bad thing, but you can be thankful in it because God has a purpose and a plan. And what is happening to you, God is doing it for you. He's doing something great. We don't always understand uh, on this side maybe but we will one day, we will see what God is doing. For, for the Christian, there's a silver lining in every cloud that we have. Maybe you've heard of, uh, I, I've told you about this guy before. He's one of my favorite characters in Christian history. His name is William Cooper. You ever heard of William Cooper? He was a man who struggled with depression, and uh, he finally got to the place where he was suicidal. He decided he was going to kill himself. And so he got a gun, But the gun misfired, and it didn't work. And then he took poison, and nothing happened. And then he decided that he was going to hang himself, but the rope broke. And then he decided he was going to drown himself in the Thames River there in London, and he got a carriage driver to take him out. But it was one of those London nights where the, the, the fog was so thick that the driver couldn't even find the river. And he came back to his house discouraged that he couldn't even kill himself, threw himself across the bed, happened to look that there was a Bible on the shelf there in that room, and he opened up the Scripture. And in time, he found the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he later became a believer, and he later began to be a hymn writer, and he's the one who wrote the words, God moves in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps on on the sea. He rides upon the storm, and he wrote this one line, judge not the Lord by feeble sense, 
but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. I love that line. You might be dealing with this year a frowning providence. It might look to you as if, from a human perspective, that God is frowning on you, but actually he's smiling. Behind the clouds, he hides a smiling face. Uh, He, again, what happens to you happens for you, and he is doing something in your life. You might not see it now. You may not see it until a year is removed. You look back and you'll say, now I understand. Now I know. This is where faith comes in where we have to trust in the sovereign hand of God. We have to trust in that principle that says all things work together for good. So regardless of how bad things may seem to you, you could be thankful in that circumstance. In her book, The Hiding Place, Corey Tinboom, she tells about how she learned this one principle. It's not easy to learn sometimes. But you remember Corey Tinboom, she and her sister were arrested by the Nazis and thrown in jail because they were hiding Jews in their home. And because of that, they were thrown into Ravensbrück camp. And there in that camp, she writes in her book, the barracks were extremely crowded. They were infested with fleas. And one morning, her and her sister were reading from the tattered Bible that they had, this very verse, 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, in everything, give thanks And Betsy said to Corey, Corey, we have to give thanks for these fleas. And Corey looked at her sister and said, there's no way I'm going to be thankful for these fleas. And, And But Betsy was very persuasive. And finally, they both knelt together and they prayed. And they thanked God for even the fleas that had infested their barracks. And during the months that followed, they found that their barracks was really left relatively free. While the soldiers really... uh, was, uh, would, would look and, uh, and, and, be di- and be hard on some of the other barracks that were there all the time rifling through their things. Their barracks, however, was left free. They were free to study the Bible. They were free to talk openly. They were free to pray together. And they later found out the reason the guards didn't go into their barracks is because of the fleas. So Corey Tim- Timbu said, I learned to be thankful for even those fleas. And everything, give thanks. We ought to be thankful for the blessings of life and the burdens of life. We ought to be grateful for the benefits of life. Write down Psalm 103, verse 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. Have you ever thought about all the benefits of God? All the blessings, all the benefits that God gives us. We woke up this morning and there was sunshine. We breathe air, God's air. Aren't you glad God doesn't charge us for any of these things? He doesn't charge us for the sunshine. He doesn't charge us for the air that we breathe. All these things are freely given to us by God. It's man that comes in and figures out a way to charge us for these things, you know. I was reading about in England in the 18th century, they came up with a tax called the window tax. What was that? One of the most senseless taxes ever levied against man by a government. In England, you had to pay a tax for how many windows you had in your house. Tax for each window. What were they doing? They were taxing them for the sunlight, charging them for the sunlight. When I read that, I thought, I'm so glad that God doesn't charge us for these things. God gives all these things to us so very freely. And we should be thankful for all of his benefits. Have you ever just been thankful for just being able to live in America, a free country? I know we're kind of living in a day when there's a lot of negative things said about our country, but I I tell you, I was just in another country. And when they found out I was an American, they they would all pretty much say the same thing. I want to come to America. Take me with you back to America. You know, I want to be there. They they seemed to just knew how blessed we were. And, And also, when they found out I was America, the price for things automatically went up. The souvenirs automatically went up. Just because I was American, they looked upon me as someone who was rich just because of being American and all the blessings that come with that. We are so incredibly blessed. But here's the third thing. Gratitude is always to be expressed. Gratitude is always to be expansive and everything. Gratitude is always to be expected. Again, look at verse 18. And everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God. 
believers are saying, you know, I'm searching for God's will. Well, you can start right here. This is God's will, that you give him thanks. It's just the will of the Lord. And this is pleasing to God. This glorifies God when we offer to him prayers and praise of thanksgiving to him. Now, this is a principle that has been established in Scripture. If you go to the Old Testament, you'll find out that um, God's people were to bring a thank offering and a peace offering every year. God prescribed that they were to do that. In fact, I think that the original holiday of Thanksgiving really comes from the Puritans who were steeped in the Old Testament. And they understood these feast days that God prescribed in Leviticus. They understood that God prescribed a a, a time when God's people were to come and bring their thanksgiving offering to the Lord. And you know what they would do with that? They would take a third of the meat, would be given to the priest. A third would be put on the altar for sacrifice. Another third they were to take and eat a meal with their friends. That's really where the Thanksgiving meal came from in the mind of the Puritans who had that first Thanksgiving meal together. It was a time of just honoring the Lord and thanking the Lord. And so um, we, do, we just did that. We, you know, your first Thanksgiving meal for the week was just a minute ago when we had this Lord's Supper together. And so it's a time when we recognize that all we have is from God, And we give a little bit back, recognizing that God is the great giver. And some people, you know, I know when when we have offerings in church, I know a lot of people criticize and they wonder why, you know. But just let me just say this. When you bring an offering to the Lord in church, you're never doing it to make God rich. God's God's not out to to get your money. I've said this before that a lot of times we, we, we just do God a great injustice by the way we preach about bringing your tithes and offerings to the Lord, as if God is in heaven with a ledger sheet looking at you and saying, you know, you owe me this much money. I'm going to get my money some way. And that's sometimes the way God is portrayed. That's such a, such a to me, a, a poor way to portray a gracious and loving God. God is not a bill collector. God is a great giver. God said, if I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you because the world is mine and the fullness thereof. Everything already belongs to God. God's not after you to get what you have. Everything you have, he gave to you. And you know what? He wants you to enjoy those blessings. And he's so gracious to give even more. The Bible says this in Romans 11, 35 and 36, or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. Who gave God a gift that wasn't already his first? was already his to begin with. You see, God doesn't want your money. You know what God wants? He wants your heart. He wants your worship. And the way that you give to the Lord, not just your offering, but your prayer, your praise, your submission to the word of God, your very life, your submission to his his preaching, his word, all of that is an act of thanksgiving and worship to God. And so we give to the Lord because it's been prescribed in Scripture. Do you know, Thanksgiving was a part of the early church. It was a big part of the early church. And I don't have time to get into it because, man, we're already past 12. I guess I'm still on Egypt time here. But let me just, let me just close it by just, um, let me just fast forward and say, if you don't have Thanksgiving in your heart, why? There's a problem there. If there's not truth, gratefulness. Let me give you some reasons why we may not be thankful. Number one, it may be because you're not genuinely saved. I mean, if you're genuinely a child of God, it is the Holy Spirit that will work in you and will give you thankfulness in your heart. That's part of being filled with the Holy Spirit. We'll give thanks to God the Father in all things, the Bible says. Or maybe we we doubt God's sovereign power. Maybe the reason you're struggling with thanksgiving is because you don't really think God is in charge. Or you really really are not sure that God is all wise. If he is in charge, why is he allowing some of these things to take place? You're not sure he knows everything about everything. Or maybe you're not sure that he really loves you as his own. Friend, if you believe those things, then you're going to struggle with thanksgiving in your heart. You know, there's a well-known counselor in our country who tells people there are times when you need to just be angry at God and go ahead and vent about God and be angry at him. Friend, that's never a good thing to do. No, we are 
to understand that God is in control and he always has our good at heart. Maybe it's another reason is because of just plain selfishness in our heart. You know, we really don't have enough. No matter what we have, it just doesn't seem to be enough. We just have to have more. And what, when we do that, when we're not really content with what he's given us, we're, we're really kind of despising the grace that God has already given us. You know, I want my circumstances different. I want my life to be different. I want my job to be different. I want my, this to be different. And we are really despising the gifts that God has already given us. Or maybe it's just plain worldliness. I mean, if you're into pleasure and you're into possessions and you're into popularity and all the things that the world values and you're not getting enough of that, if you are a worldly-minded person, you're going to have trouble being thankful to God. Or if you just have a critical spirit. If you just, you know, when Jesus said, judge not that you be not judged, we, that's the most misinterpreted verse in the Bible. What he was talking about is the people who are hypercritical, critical over the smallest little things, and if you have a critical spirit, friend, you're going to have trouble being thankful to God. Don't allow a critical spirit to dwell in your heart. Or maybe it's just impatience. God's not working fast enough for you. Maybe you've been praying about something and God hasn't answered that and you're still waiting. God has a perfect time. But if you're impatient, you're going to have trouble being thankful. Or maybe it's just coldness of heart. You, you just lack a zeal for God. You lack a diligence in your, in your pursuit of God. There, there's no passion in your worship. There's no passion in your prayer. You neglect the Bible. That's a cold heart. And friend, if you have a cold heart, you're going to have trouble being thankful. Or maybe it's just out and out rebellion. I mean, this really mitigates against gratitude when you're just angry at God because things have not gone your way. Friend, if these things are true in your heart, you're going to, you're going to have trouble being thankful. And what you need to do is you need to go to God and you need to confess this as sin. You need to ask God for his forgiveness, for his cleansing, and ask God to give you the right perspective, to give you a grateful heart. You know, um, and let me just close with this. It's interesting that the evergreen tree is associated with Christmas. Um, but, you know, I think really in, in, a, in a way it can be the symbol of thanksgiving. You say, in what way? Well, the evergreen tree is always green despite the weather. Despite the outward circumstances, it's always green. In the heat of summer, in the cold of winter, it doesn't matter. The, the tree is always green, and that's the way it should be for a child of God. We should always be thankful. Our hearts should always be filled with gratitude, no matter the outward circumstances Inwardly, we still have that grateful heart to God for all of his blessings. The psalmist said this, What shall I render unto the Lord for all of his benefits? And then he answers his own question when he says, I will take the cup of salvation. I will call upon the name of the Lord. Let's, let's bow for prayer together. Just take a moment and just, would you... Use this as a time just to you personally offering a prayer of thanksgiving to God. Just right there where you are, right there where you're seated, just take a moment and would you just offer up a prayer to God for what he has done for you. Heavenly Father, again, we offer unto you today in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, we come and we offer unto you the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving for what you've done to a God who is, whose greatness is unsearchable, whose love is infinite, whose mercy is everlasting. We with all our heart, with every fiber of our being, we give you praise, we give you thanks for who you are. And we pray all this in Jesus' wonderful, mighty name. Amen. Bless